everybody. Um, yeah, I teach uh, English and creative writing here on campus, and um, I just wanted to welcome these guys. You know, I, I know Pat um, from some other projects, and he told me about this story, and I just found it really compelling. I think that it's a story that needs to be told. Um, I really like the kind of the social justice aspect to it, and I think that it you know, kind of fits the mission of uh, Savannah State and the kind of things that we uh, address here and explore here. And um, then it was a podcast, and then I, I, I met uh, Zach through some um, other things, and it's just kind of neat. And then, we, you know, we have Andrew back here who uh, did the music for the podcast. And I was just saying informally to these guys, it's really remarkable that in a town this size, how all of these artistic communities come together for all different projects. Um, just looking out, I see people who do other projects in town. And so, so welcome to Savannah State as kind of the representative of uh, Savannah State. And thank you to the library um, for giving us the space. Thank you to Zach. Thank you to Pat. Thank you uh, to the College of Li Liberal Arts and Social yeah. Sciences and the Department of English. Um, yeah, thanks to my students. I see one coming in right here. So, uh, great. Uh, thanks for supporting these events because then we can um, make more of these things happen here on campus. So, uh, welcome. Thanks, Chad. Yeah. Uh, my name is Pat Longstreth, and I am a documentary filmmaker. Um, I've made a few short documentaries and one feature that uh, has screened here in Savannah. Um, and uh, we had one short 30-minute uh, doc with Amy Condon. And uh, uh, she wrote, I don't know if any of you know her, she works at Savannah Morning News. And she wrote a great biography about a man named Bill Bax. And we turned it into a documentary that's on Miami Public TV right now. Uh, mm -hmm. We won a regional Emmy for it, which was pretty cool. Um, me and my, I say we, it's me and my wife work together. She's not here at the moment, but um, uh, I learned about Janie and her amazing projects at the 50th anniversary of the Thiokol um, project uh, and, the, and the, the Thiokol commemoration. And uh, I was just so amazed by the story. Uh, I thought this, this really should be a documentary. And so I went down to the museum and we met Janie and uh, then uh, pretty quickly decided uh, we wanted to pitch to her the idea of doing a documentary and then uh, she, she agreed to it and then uh, about nine months later I was having a conversation with Zach about this project and asked him if he would be interested in um, maybe taking all the audio interviews that we had at that point and turning them into a podcast and so now we have, uh, or uh, Zach and Nancy, and I guess me too, we've produced a seven-part uh, podcast that you can listen to on the Savannah Morning News. Uh, it's got Nancy's uh, very soothing voice <laughs> as the narration. <laughs> and uh, so, have, so uh, you'll, you'll enjoy it. We have QR codes if you have not listened to it outside. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And, um, and then we have Janie here, obviously our, uh, the hero of our story. So... Uh, we'll watch a 12-minute uh, sort of excerpt of the film that I'm working on. We're, we're hoping it'll be, at the very least, an hour-long special on Georgia Public Broadcasting, uh, but we're also working to maybe get more funding to make it a, a whole limited series on a bigger streaming platform. So, um, you know, look out for it. And uh, we'll, we'll show you that now. This is the, uh, the, the website for the petition. Jane's got flyers for you, too. We'll put this back up at the end if anybody wants to uh, sign the petition. This is a petition to get the victims of the Thiokol uh, explosion uh, awarded the Congressional, Medal, uh, Congressional Gold Medal. So that, that would be a, a great, um, you know, outcome for this story, we think. So... Uh, are we, oh, could we turn off the lights, I guess, for the, for this part of the event? Let me make sure, oh, we just turn on audio. Everybody ready? Yeah. I'm just 
testing the speakers here. This is some other video I had. <laughs> This is for a billionaire's 50th birthday party. <laughs> so that's what I do in my other eight <laughs> All right. So here we go. This is the first time I've been back out here. And I told my name, I'm like, you'll we'll never come back. <laughs> and you say, I'm a good time out here. Just like a one big happy family. This whole story was so painful that it had quietly been tucked away. It was fun for me when I started working out there because I, I loved it, you know, and uh, that was really my first paying job and, you know, having my money. I bought me a car and I bought me a trail and then I took care of my kids. Liberty minimum wage, and you got a chance to do eight hours work, five days a week in a good environment. You had health insurance. They had very good benefits. And it wasn't that far from home, it was right here in Camden County. I had just finished high school and I'd had a baby out of wedlock. And I was thrilled to get a job where I just got paid by the hour. They'd tell about the safety of teachers and stuff. And they'd put me on this line. And these missiles was coming down this line. My job was weighing the gunpowder. So if I was slow, the line was slow because there were people waiting on me. They were laying the groundwork for women that today work in factories. You had to put on this paper suit, put on some rubber boots, you had to wear a gas mask. Miss Esther Bang, she would come in and she was just brilliant and happy. Cheryl Sullivan, she was young and bubbly and full of energy. And Gloria Walker, she always was smiling. She had a baby and she just got married and sealed. She come in the morning and she would be singing, clapping Jesus on the main line, telling what you want. Growing up, in the first grade with all these upperclassmen, I wanted to be just like them. They drove cars, they dated, they played football, they played in a band, they sang in the chorus, and then they would graduate and they would get a job. They were my heroes. I I'm so glad that I witnessed their lives. They brought hope. They came trying to get a contract to produce uh, solid rocket boosters for the space program. And it failed. Their, their, their casing broke, and, and ultimately the, the, the NASA people decided to go with liquid fuel propellants. In fact, I was able to get other contracts to stay in business, and, and that's where the contract of the trip players came in. Everybody that worked in that building was working for the Vietnam War. We made trip players for Vietnam. They had fires all the time. We ran every day. That big Oven, it had everything in it. Fire went right down the hall, and that was what it was. Twenty-nine died, twice that number burned. Jacksonville responded to the call for help and sent two rescue units to the scene. This was a response never seen before in this area. The first explosion blew me out of there, and so I hit the ground running. Whatever way I felt, it was it was something there and I couldn't get by it. I'm going to die today. Mom, take care of my children. I said goodbye to each shop, and then I laid down to bless the God for giving me. Whatever I did, Lord, I don't want to suffer. We make it quick. And then the wind blows. I could see. And when I stood up, as far as I could see, when the body was all out there. The first line of defense for the backhaul plant workers were their co workers. They just had each other until outside help got there. 
Yeah. And so my mother went back. Did your mom save her mom's life? Or? She rescued her. Rescued her? Yeah. I picked up and put on a truck. I don't know how in the world I did it. Well, I was in another building when the explosion happened, but it didn't take me but a minute to get down there. <laughs> what did you do when you got there? You had to, you had to pick up those people and put out fires, little fires inside the building. We got some ambulances in, we got some helicopters in, and we sent them to the critical care facilities in Jacksonville, and Brunswick, and Savannah. I just remember hearing sirens. Helicopters flying over our school. I got on the back of one of the fire trucks and went down. Not being a fireman at that time, I just got on. I just said, I need to go down there. Out of all I've seen in Vietnam, it was, it was horrible. They start pulling off bodies, you know, and then they hear somebody groaning, and they found me down there. Yeah, the black animals, the white animals. When I got there, as far as I went, was the gate to where they had the bodies stacked. People were coming to the gate to find out if their relatives were okay or were they deceased or what was happening to them. I was given an injection to a young lady and when I asked her a name, she got very upset because she told me, you know who I am. And I did not recognize her. But as soon as she started talking, I guess I knew who she was. She was a classmate of mine. Jimmy Carter was the governor, and he came down and uh, went around and they made their pronouncements. We were just thankful to have a bunch of good guys that uh, were willing to take the responsibility and, and helping other people. Well, I went almost 16 hours in a day. He got home and couldn't go to sleep. Everybody that could help, did help. You know, if you get those people, the ones that were injured as well as the ones that were looking for their loved ones. It's just like you can look out today and see it. Two or three days later they came and they told me, you know the body that you saw burning was in a fetal position? That was your sister, Gracie Life. A few days later she passed. My aunt C. Alberta, she was doing the fast uh, workers on the assembly line. She stayed in there to help her co-workers, co-workers. She had seven kids and um, I think the, her baby was like about two years old. One young lady was uh, pregnant but she got, she got killed. And we have a few of them now that still suffer from the mental anguish and they, they never got any help or any compensation or anything. I don't know exactly how they even existed until I received some funds from lawsuits. What did you do to overcome it? Well, we just, you know, stayed with, with one another, you know, and encouraged one another. A week later, they called me and asked me, did I want to come back to help me up? No, uh-uh. One week later? Yes, they wanted to know, did I want to come back and help clean up? Some of the leaders said they couldn't go back because they had back A lot of people said, why you went back? Well, you, you know, you had to do what you had to do. The lawsuit was filed against Black Hall and the U.S. government. The way it was functioning had been classified by the Army as a fire hazard, Class 2, which is not very exciting. It should have been a Class 7, which is an explosion hazard. A note was found in some government employee's desk drawer that said that they were supposed to notify us, but they didn't. The federal government sent down people, and they went over the contracts, they inspected the buildings. They did everything they could to minimize the worth of the people that were killed that day. When they came back with this thing about being unskilled, uh, causing the death of their co-workers, the federal government should have never tried that. When they put me on the stand to testify. That's when I saw the whole political side of it. The questions they were asking me were questions as to minimize my mother. Eventually, the litigation was over and the plaintiff had won. It was primarily women and primarily black women. He 
he had a trial for Mr. Arts only. And he awarded Mr. Arts $532,000 and his wife like $74,000. Do you remember anything about Mr. Arts? I know he was white. I'm pretty sure that lawyers got more than the injured did. And you're going against the government, and we was working for the government. You got to get what we can get. There were some folk who did not get anything. We're talking about the big boy. Looking at some black women who they were able to get all welfare and, and give them a job. Our government cared less about the humanity of the people. Here's something like this happen again. They would have everything in place. The Camden County Daycare Center, that was one of the, the things that happened, you know, because of the explosion. Do you remember working with each of these folks? Anyone of them. Any place you play, housekeeping is the major thing. And the best thing that will happen to a working man is OSHA. Even people that live there today do not have any idea of what happened. My kids had mentioned it. I hadn't seen anything about it. Their Georgia history, their local history. We want people, especially the children, that know what happened. They lost their life, just like over in Vietnam. They made a contribution to the nation and to humanity. And we would like them recognized with the Congressional Gold Medal. If you don't remember your past, sometimes you might repeat it. I just wanted to mention there's a bunch of folks in the audience here who are in the documentary or contributed to the podcast, so you can talk to them after the event if you want. We have Emma Lou here who started off the documentary. She worked at the plant and then continued to work for the plant and the other companies that came after that all for 36 years. We have uh, Reverend Jesse Blackshear who was in the film. We have um, uh, Andrew Sovine who did the score for the podcast. Um, maybe maybe somebody else, but I don't know. So anyway, uh, it'll be exciting to um, you know just get everyone involved. Yeah. Um, um, well, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, it wouldn't be a Savannah Morning News uh, event if the internet wasn't working and we were 20 minutes late. So. <laughs> um, I think Pat already introduced everybody: Pat Longstreth, Zach Dennis, Janie Everett, and uh, Nancy Gwan. Um, we're gonna, you, you got kind of got a taste of the documentary there, the Tripwire podcast. Like I said before, there's QR codes in the front. If you have not listened to it, please do. That gives you a wide range of, of this story, kind of from all different angles. And Nancy and I just finished that a couple weeks ago. Started at the beginning of February, ran through the uh, entire month um, with seven episodes. They're about 20, 30 minutes each. Um, and it was something that Pat came to us and kind of pitched, going, "Hey." I've been working on this thing for a year, getting these interviews with these survivors. There's, there's this incredible story that um, is literally relegated to two lines in the Camden County history books. Uh, what can we do to get the word out more? Um, and so working, you know, kind of wanting to do something with the newspaper that was more than just a newspaper story, do something multimedia, do something that engages people and, uh, you know, with learning and education in a different way. Um, I kind of wanted to try something with a podcast and audio format, and we were really lucky to have somebody like Nancy on staff who is immensely talented, if you've listened to the podcast, at doing audio reporting, um, the research involved, things like that. And so I kind of wanted to just start this off um, by talking a little bit to Pat and Janie since they really kicked this thing off 
um, and talk a little bit about what, Pat, for you, what, what got you attached to the story and what kind of um, initially was like, this is the reason I didn't make a documentary. Yeah, well, I first read about it in the current uh, .org, um, your, your competitor, I guess, uh, maybe, or collaborator sometimes. Um, yeah, the current .org, it's a great uh, local news source about, they cover all of coastal Georgia. And Laura Corley wrote this amazing uh, story about the 50th anniversary, and she interviewed Jamie, and, and then, um, and it kind of stuck with me for a few weeks, and then, um, like a month later, I, st I just started thinking, man, somebody's got to make a documentary about this, but I don't, I didn't think I was the right person. For one, my other documentary work is more like heartwarming and fun and family friendly. Um, and this is very serious. And um, it's also, you know, black history. Um, and so I thought, uh, you know, but I kept thinking about it. And then I, I started researching it. And I learned that Thia Call was also responsible, or they, they, were, they were partially responsible for the uh, Challenger disaster. They made the rockets that, um, you know, failed. And so, uh, so that was really interesting to me. And then I went and watched the Challenger documentary on Netflix because I knew about it, but I hadn't been in the mood to watch it. But then this got me interested. And, and I watched that four-part series, and it really inspired me because they were able to tell the story of that tragedy that, you know, if any of you know the story of the Challenger, you probably know it, and then you're like, ah, okay, that's it, I don't really need to know much more. Um, but if you watch the way they presented it, you know, it was really very inspiring and interesting, and, um, and it paid tribute to the, to the people um, that, you know, we lost. And so I thought, well, maybe we could apply a similar sort of um, treatment to this story. And so that's, that's what I've tried to do with this. And, um, and then, so then my wife and I went down and visited the museum, and we were just blown away. The museum's fantastic, by the way. If you all are on your way to Florida or Jacksonville, um, you know, it's a great stop. You could is spend... It in Where is it? It's, uh, it's, it's actually in Kingsland. Good question. Um, right near Woodbine. Um, and it's not far off the Highway 95 there. And uh, you'll see the exit. It's the Patriots of Thiokol uh, interchange. interchange. Yeah. Um, so that so going to the museum really uh, piqued my interest even more. And then uh, talking to Janie, uh, you know, we, we, we were thinking we'd be there for like an hour. We were there for three hours. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Janie will give you a great tour if you go. And um, and then and then she agreed to let us start making the, the film. So yeah. yeah. Janie, when you started to work on, because you grew up in Woodbine, your mother, as we saw in the documentary, was involved in the tragedy. Um, what sparked you to go, we need to tell this story because clearly people in our hometown aren't remembering what happened you know, 30, 40 years before? Well, what happened is I was babysitting the great grandchildren of Ethel Banks, and these same children are the great-grandchildren of my mother. So my nephew married her granddaughter. And I was babysitting them Christmas time. The children were on the internet, and they came up with this story about Thaco. And I was watching something on HBO or something, and they said, Auntie, what's a Thaco? No, they, at first they said, it was there an explosion in Thaco? And, Woodbine. I didn't move, but when they said thigh call, I got up, went into the room where they were at, what it was going on, and I looked at the story. The second person in the list is their great grandmother. They didn't know her. They didn't know she was killed in this explosion. No one had told them the story. It was not being taught in school. And that list on the internet was wrong. Hmm. They had two Chapmans. There was never two brothers killed in this explosion. There was two sisters killed in the explosion. So that led me to the Brian Lang Historical Society and now into what we have now is the Thaco Memorial Project. This story had been hidden locked away and with the help of, of Pat and with the help of Nancy and Zach, you know, 
what we're doing is recording the human melody of the voice. Storytelling is a fantastic thing. You can teach empathy while you're teaching history, and you can draw the beauty and the strength from the lives of others. And this is what we wanted to do, and this is what they actually helped us to do. And these people have been beat down so much to 17 years in court, um, thinking no one cared, um, just being told that you're less than. But we were able to bring them together, and Pat and his wife, Ann, they were very instrumental in reassuring them Calm, bringing calm to the situation. See, it's not what you ask, it's how you ask. Okay? So, once I got our group of people together, identified them, wrote their bios, the questions, did the intro in between the parties. They moved in and uh, uh, they built a trust with them. And this allowed these people almost 45, you know, 48, 50 years later to tell their side of the story. And it was a work of art. And I, I appreciate it. Thanks, Jane. Um, yeah, I, I was just want to mention um, um, and, and, you know, and Zach and Nancy did the same thing with their, they did a lot of their own interviews uh, yeah. and got people in the right comfort level to open up. Um, and, and yeah, there were uh, some folks we interviewed that said, this is the first time I've talked about this in 50 years, and this is the last time I'll ever talk about it. So, you know, when they start off the interview with that, <laughs> it's like, okay, no pressure. We only have one, one shot at this. <laughs> um, so, you know, we feel very fortunate. We've already had several of our interviewees pass away. And, um, you know, a lot of them are in their 80s or 90s. So, um, you know, I think... Uh, I think we are the right people to tell this story now because a lot of folks didn't want to talk about it for good reason, and um, this is finally a chance to talk about it before um, they pass on. So, um, um, yeah. Nancy, you, you know, we we kind of took what Pat had as like a as like a baseline, and kind of I think you watched the documentary there, and the podcast are very similar, but also kind of doing two, like two different things, um, listening to the. To the interviews, especially like the unfiltered, raw, like hour-long interviews that, because he, Pat sent us, you know, three to seven minute clips that he was like, this is the good stuff, but we also dug a little bit deeper and watched the full interviews as well. Um, what did you find as these, as these people recounted this, this tragedy, um, what did you find from their recounts to, to Pat and his wife? Um, yeah, I mean, Pat did amazing in those interviews, like what Zach said. Um, for some of the interviewees, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper in their stories, and a lot of them were like over an hour long. Um, and I think especially for the episodes where we're recounting the explosion, like the actual event, we wanted the um, survivors and the witnesses to really kind of speak for themselves. Like we didn't want to like narrate and you know, tell their story. So for those interviews in particular, um, you know, just combing through the transcript and the audio um, and kind of piecing together, you know, the really kind of salient parts of their interview and, you know, creating this narrative that people would be able to listen to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was a lot of work, but um, it was worth it in the end, so. This is, you know, for you, but as well as Pat, how, how do you tell the story, you know, you mentioned you, your documentaries are usually something different, how do you tell the story without bogging down people in, in misery and tragedy? Because I think that there is, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel for this, um, and so how do you all tell this story without kind of going, it's just going to be a tough time for a few, you know, 45, 50 minutes or so? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I've tried to watch some other similar documentaries to figure out the best way to do that. Because, um, yeah, I think if it's too sad for too long, people will turn it off, you know. Um, we, we have a 45-minute cut that um, we're, that's how far we're at right now. Um, and uh, I think that cut, 
does stay a little bit too sad, but our plan is to uh, keep coming back to Janie, pretty much, and, and, and her efforts to honor these people and uh, to get them the medal, uh, a congressional medal, a gold medal, and to, um, you know, just, just show the value in, um, in recognizing their sacrifice and, and taking these lessons forward to today, getting younger people to understand um, that we have to get involved in our um, electoral process to make sure politicians can um, put in regulations and, and so that we can give OSHA the resources they need to, to you know, create this oversight so that, because companies are really, in my opinion, going to do whatever they can to make a profit and it's up to us to put those parameters in place. Um, and so, so I think empowering our audience to, to, to see these lessons and be like, oh yeah, maybe I could do something to prevent this from happening. Um, and, then, and then the audience will feel engaged and, and, and like there's a value in watching it, not just, uh, not just witnessing tragedy. Well, that was definitely uh, yeah. literally the first question. We spoke to a number of Savannah State students earlier today, and the first question was, how do we make this not ever happen again? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and those were young folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah really exciting to, to hear their responses. Yeah. Uh, I have a question um, for Janie. Um, every time I talk to Janie, some amazing harrowing story comes out. I'm like, Janie, why didn't you tell me that a year ago? You know, and like today we were having lunch, and she said, um, I asked her about if there was a, an environmental impact to this story because we haven't really covered that. And um, you said that actually um, there wasn't much of an environmental impact, but that's because the firefighters and the first responders worked to control the um, contamination, keep it from going into the creek, and that they were putting out fires that day, and there were, there were live ammunitions that were in the line of fire. So this was like, they weren't just putting out fires and pulling out dead bodies. They were trying to stop even more, uh, you know, explosions and devastation. So... I don't even want to tell us about that side of it. <laughs> yeah. no, what, what, what happens is there is so much history in this history. It's like, okay, he put me on the spot then. That story or information came from the first fireman that arrived on the scene. His name was Morris Peoples from Kingsland Volunteer Fire Department. And what you have to understand is today we have these great fire departments and they're being paid. The fire departments back then were volunteer. And all of the ambulances were run by the individual funeral homes. They, and it was segregated. Blacks for black funeral homes, whites for white funeral homes. But back to the story. On that particular day, when Morris Peoples arrived at Black Hall, he um, was confronted with 200 plus acres on fire. It's 7,400 acres of land. That used to be the old Floyd Floyd Plantation. There are creeks that run through that area, beautiful area. Todd Creek is out there. So when he got there, munitions were going off. Well, these munitions were made for the United States Army. So you not only had, you had 14, 16 cities stand up, but one of those cities was Hinesville because Fort Stewart is there. So you had the Army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, and all of these cities respond to this emergency. And the urgency of the moment was to stop the chemicals from getting into the groundwater. Todd Creek was there. You go out Todd Creek, you make a right and another right, you're in deep water. But you have a lot of tributaries and rivers that run around that area. So they wanted to stop the contamination. They didn't want it to spread. They cut those fire lines. Everybody went out there. Some of them did yeoman's work. But everybody worked together to stop a major disaster that day. So you had human life on the line, but you had, in the long term, a possible problem. But the firefighters took care of it that day. They did their job. 
And I think for that, they should be recognized in a national park with the 600 workers, the 14 hospitals. Actually, Yvonne Conley died here at Telfair Hospital. She was born in Savannah. She was transported to Savannah. She died in Savannah. And she's buried in Savannah. You know, we took our time. We found mm -hmm. out the resting places of all 30 of the people. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we did last year we had not done is the one person that was never paid, family was never compensated, the six families, but she didn't have a headstone. Mm -hmm. So we did a campaign. We purchased her a headstone. Actually, her home church mm -hmm. did most of the heavy lifting to pay for this headstone. It's listed, um, she's in a cemetery. It's Oak Grove. And it's one thing about Camden County, Revolutionary War men are also buried in that cemetery. So it's a long history of contributions to the nation. So her, her, her grave is now marked with a headstone which we purchased. We had the Vietnam veterans come and present the the colors that day, we wanted to let it be known that we are a grateful nation. And when those veterans pulled those colors that day, their lives have been saved by the work of the women and the men of Thakol. Nobody knows that the women were the manufacturers. And so we want history. You know, at some point you have to see the beauty at some point, you have to appreciate, today is National Vietnam War Veterans Day. This is the welcome home that they never had before. Mm -hmm. President Trump signed it in 2017. So on this day, it's remarkable that after 50 some years of our people passing away, you know, and the war didn't end until 1975. These people were killed in 71. And believe me, that plant did not shut down. But today we are here at Savannah State College or University talking about honoring and remembering the people from FICO. It's time for us to step up. We need the help of every American citizen to do what we need to do. We need to teach empathy. We need to teach this inspirational story or educate our young people. They need this assurance because, you know, people talk about America being racist and this and that and other. Let me tell you, I am 69 years old. I have been around the world. There is no country even better or close to America. It's not the oceans that separate us from the rest of the world. It's that desire to do good and to do right. And on February 3rd, 1971, yes, we're in the deep south. We're the tide. We are the tide. Every hope and every dream of everybody in the world washes up on our shore. Okay? But on that day, Segregation died. Put a pen in it. It was done. No more SPR at the hospital. No more funeral home segregated ambulance service. No more privilege. And I-95 was finished because there was privilege riding on 17. Okay? And every little girl in America could look at this story and know that they could get a job. These women lived and died before ERA. So we need to bring it together. Yes, we are a tribal nation. We're, we're, we're little tribes. Our freedom makes us live by preference, okay? But what happens is this. When something happens, all the tribes they come together and form one nation. We really love each other. We don't care to live with each other, <laughs> but we love each other. You know, I can fuss and fight and we can argue, we disagree, 
But if something happens, they're going to come and see about you. Now that's love. So we need to show our people that we love them. We appreciate the sacrifice they made, the contribution they made. And let's take a page from their book and get up, brush ourselves off. It's a circumstance, not a destination. And move on. That's all I got to say. Yeah. <laughs> We have a reverend in the house, so you know he can't keep his mouth. <laughs> May I object this? Um, I probably won't get an opportunity to do this again because um, I don't have as much time on this side of the river. But 1971, when um, this explosion took place, I was in freshman member of the Georgia House of Representatives. And I want to thank Janie for what she just said. And I want to thank her for her contribution. And I want to thank this our beloved sister, Emma, one of the originals. And from the perspective of a legislator, and uh, from the perspective that those who were elected to stand in the gap for a citizen did not. Yes, you were white, and you didn't expect them to in certain areas, and especially when we got to the point of the legal apparatus. Hill Jones and Farrington's law firm, um, deeply involved in. Uh, that representing representing the group of, of those folk um, for me it was extremely grueling and I sincerely say to you that it's very difficult for me even at this time to listen and to hear you talk about it. And as I remember what went on, um, I wasn't impressed with the state government. I wrote, worked in the Carter administration. And I don't know if, if you're going to deal with the reality and you're going to sugarcoat it and act like it covered over it. And I'm not one now. Time has passed, and, and that's, it, that's that's and we have we have moved on, we, and we're talking about what's that fifty some years, and I'm most appreciative for those persons who did what they did to help people because they were black and white and hurt and helping him in that situation. And to know that these African American women and others were dealing with the tripwires, napalm bombs, 
Yes, making a contribution to the wall. Yes, the politicals of Camden County, not Camden County, but the counties around taking advantage in the sense of paying them low wages. And you expect it. What, 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 what you expect? You're talking about 50 years ago. My, um, a dollar, what, what was the minimum wage? Um, um, and so, and I, and I sincerely understand the need for employment. And I don't disassociate myself with them. My people need, need, need a place to work and survive and, and make it. And I understand that. And I thank God for them. I regret so much that the lawyers got so much money, and that's to be expected. Understand how that system works, and it was such a long, long hour before. Finally, Attorney Bobby Hill, Joe Jones, Fletcher Farrington were part of bringing that for their clients to to that to that particular point. Now, notice how I said it that particular point because those folk who who were injured at their families. My heart will never forget that. Reverend, we got a fantastic interview with you, by the way, so there's going to be uh, a, lot, a lot of you in the documentary. <laughs> so I just want to say that your, your voice will be uh, remembered. Oh. And, um, before yeah, we before yeah. we kind of open it up for some stuff, I want to just uh, kind of put a bow on things real quickly. And Janie, give you the floor. You have a I yeah. think a open ears in front. What what action do you want to see to help further the cause that you're pushing? Well, the Thaco Memorial Project established in 2015 after about two years of research. What we want to do, our ultimate, ultimate goal is to plan, build, and endow a Thiokol Memorial National Monument. That means a national park on the Department of Interior, where we remember and honor the 600 workers. We have 30 that were killed, 570 that um, survived, or plant workers that survived. We have 16 cities, 14 hospitals, the Army, Navy, and the Coast Guard. We want to build a national park in Camden County on the north end of Camden County, along the interstate. Okay? That would certainly be not only a, a tourist attraction, but it would be an educational facility. Um, it would be an opportunity for storytelling, to teach empathy, to bring sustained economic growth to the region, also to say thank you and bring healing and closure once and for all to the Vietnam War. You know, it hurts my feelings. I'm a Vietnam era veteran. I went in the military right after this explosion, okay? I didn't see any combat, but I know what the stuff is that they worked with, okay? 
My mother was a manufacturer, but I trained in this stuff in Alabama and different regions. But I want to say this. As a grateful nation and all of the, the impact, how our lives were improved, we need to build that national park. We need to take a page out of the privileged people on Highway 17. Camden County has 26 miles of the interstate. Nobody comes close to us, and I'm telling you, I know geography. Savannah has 19 miles. You say hello and goodbye, okay? And we say hello and goodbye. Camden, Chatham, okay? We need to use this welcome space to build the economy and keep our young people at home in this region. They have the talent and the skills to not only build, but to run this national park. And our people, 50 years from now, or 100, we want the young people to be able to walk into that education center and press a button and listen to the harmony, the voices of the people that are the era of the Thakal history, this history that was buried. They actually, and, and I, I know what you're thinking, but let me tell you this. Their names were excluded from history because there's one thing about a man in the South, okay? He is going to protect the virtue of a woman if he has to stand in front of a moving car, okay? These men worked themselves into an early grave until these women were legally able to make a wage, okay? Mm -hmm. The women were killed at thigh call, and when people went after and started to attack the bad actors, they printed the women's names in the newspaper, the town they were from. They listed the names of the injured, and the hospitals they were in. The bad actors went to and went after the children of the deceased women. Some of these women were single or they went after their elderly parents. Sign over the life insurance. Sign over your right to sue. You know, they threatened them. Hurt your kids. This is why these names were buried. That's why it, it's not, if you look at the Great Camden disaster, it says on the front, the names have been intentionally eliminated. Mm -hmm. No, omitted to eliminate any possibility of embarrassment. How embarrassing is it, is, is it when a person gives their life for a country and they turn around and say, oh, you're poor. Let me tell you something. Poor don't live here. Poor don't live here. Y'all have not seen poor. Poor don't live here. It lives here in your mind if you let it. But poor don't live here. Absolutely not. So they said they're poor. That's not a crime. Women, that's not a crime either. Okay? Unskilled. Trust me, that's not a crime, but the proof is in M132, 56,322 trip flares resting, you can't do that and be unskilled and already have three arsenals you have supplied. On the morning of the explosion at 1053, when the plant blew up, you had 56,322 trip flares resting with 8,000 pounds of magnesium and 1,400 pellets. How can you be unskilled? And, but the, the ugly thing, to say illiterate and even the ugliest thing, you caused your own injury and the death of your co-workers. America, you need to apologize. There's no excuse for that type of behavior. That's ugly. That's ugly. I mean, you know, we have done some things that's taken a, a point beyond. 
But when God wants you to do right, he puts you in that position. And now we are in the position to do the right thing. We took all the good from this tragedy. The good, these people discovered their purpose in life. Their purpose in life was to bring the union together. This was a workplace where women and men worked together on a mission. The women made an hourly wage and held supervisory positions. They were the manufacturers, some of them. I mean, you know, the women were. And they were union workers. And this was before ERA. Give them their place in American history. You can't keep dodging this. Yes. Like I've said to the people at the Vietnam Memorial Museum, just put a plaque inside the museum with the 30 people's names on it. You know, there's, if, if you don't know what I'm saying, I don't mind explaining it to you. <laughs> you know, if someone says, well, Miss Everett, you don't qualify for this medal. I'm not asking you for no medal for myself. I'm asking for someone else. They don't have to be X, Y, Z. They just have to make a contribution. And my God, can't you see that they have contributed? So what I'm saying is this. We have this petition. Please sign it. Spread it around the country, have people to sign it, mm -hmm. and let's get on with it. You got 95 million people in South Viet Vietnam. 211,000 signed a petition, and our president went to Vietnam, made those people whole, they cleaned up the fields in 2016. What I'm saying is now charity begins at home. It's 330 million of us. We got the power. Sign the petition. Come on, let's do what's right by our own people. And let's teach this empathy. Our young people need to know, yes, we are tribal. We're tribal, no problem. We have freedom. We make choices. But if something happens, we step up. God reaches out, what will you do? You're going to come forward. He said, okay, I, time out, I'm going to see about this person. And that's what happens in America. Then when the disaster's over, we go right back to our preference. Because we have freedom, but we really love each other. So I need y'all help. I'm 69 and tired. Come on, boy, y'all. <laughs> um, well, we'll stay. We'll stick around. Uh, we have, Janie will be here. Uh, Miss Emma Lou's up here up front. She's a survivor of the explosion. If you'd like to talk with her, uh, Reverend Black Blackshear's here as well. Um, before we, we kind of open the floor and let, if, if anybody else has any other comments or things like that, I want to direct you, just say again, thank you so much for coming out today. We really appreciate it from the Savannah Morning News. Um, if you would like, you know, we need, we need your support as well. We got a QR code in the back. If, you, if you're not subscribed to the newspaper, that would do a lot to really help us. Um, if you would like to listen to the podcast, we have co codes for those as well. I mean, just listen to it, share it, let people know. Get, give people if they if you're you're telling the story and you're like, I don't, they don't, they don't know what it is. This is a very easy way to kind of get them on board and understand what's going on down here. Um, support Pat with his endeavors with the documentary um, ThighCallMemorial.org. Uh, you can find the petition there. But um, thank you all again. Uh, but we'll open it up now. If anybody else has any comments, Sister Pat. Oh, good evening. Um, thank you, Pat. <laughs> thank you, Savannah Morning News. My sister, Evelyn. My brother, State Representative Jesse Blackshear. His mother and my mother were best friends. Her name was Georgia Blackshear. I thank you for remembering 
I got a lot of hats, but I came here today because of an invitation. I'm the fellow, policy fellow, for the Truth Telling Project. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that we offer our services to you to help you in this effort to get the um, medals. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that the Truth Telling Project has members in there. This is hard because I really want to wail right now. <laughs> but I'll wait until I get to the water <laughs> on this campus and I'm going to wail. Special respect for the elder in the room. I forgot to ask your permission, the oldest elder, to speak. I say to Dr. Maxine Wright from the Gullah Beachy Center, who represent here. In 1987, one of the members was in the basement of the White House just to encourage your work. When Ronald Reagan gave out $20,000 checks each to the Japanese American survivors of the World War II uh, uh, incident where they in, interned them. Eric Saul, University of West Virginia at Morganton, got medals of honor, gold medals of honor, for each of those uh, survivors and their descendants. He got 272 medals. I have one. And so they send word to you. If we can help you to get the medals, we're on board. I would also say for the children that are here, that are descendants, and the ones that are coming, I think that should also be repair. So I stand here as a 21st century abolitionist and reparationist to say, I'd like to see medals, and I'd like to see money for education for those babies to have free college for every generation that comes. Because we know education is empowerment. So think not just about the medals, We'll put a wish list together. I want medals, I want reparations, I want business grants. Hampton County is impoverished and we need to do better. So I will say to you, thank you for inviting me. I look forward to talking with you, but I want you to know that there are many people across the nation that are ready to help. And now, in the 21st century, these young people have all this fancy equipment. So now we can do it better. Back in our day, we had to keep the car running <laughs> in the middle of the night. So we thank you and know that you got some help nationally as well as here. And of course, the Gullah Geechee people say, we are the ones that know the going on around here. And we are the ones who must tell the story. Thank you for being your own truth tellers. Tell the story and let them do four things. Truth tell. Get some reconciliation, get some healing, and then them turn can get some repair. Thank you. All right, refreshments. Oh. <laughs> I, I just was wondering about the filmmaking process, and that you were talking about how do you take someone through this story, this painful story, for so long. And if you thought about using your journey of coming to know this story from seeing the blur to being as dedicated as Jamie is, um, as, as a device that could help the audience sort of learn with you. Yeah, um, I don't usually put myself in front of the camera. Um, I mean, I guess I'm in front of the camera now with Jamie, but um, I, I don't, I'm not a, opposed to being in front of the camera I just don't like the sound of my own voice <laughs> and uh, and I but no I mean seriously I just think that um, other people tell the story better than me um, and and but I, I would like I, I would say that the, the format of the documentary that I'm going for is sort of similar to, to my personal journey in, in learning about this um, so so there is that um, and what, what y'all saw here, it was 12 minutes, and probably nine of those minutes were, were just sort of uh, showing the tragedy the way it is. But I think the full, like, 90-minute doc um, 
at least that that'll probably only be about a third of it, you know, because there's so much more interesting details with the first response and the court case and um, just what what Camden County is like today. These amazing commemoration events that Janie puts on every year, um, mm -hmm. and and the education process. And I really want to talk more about um, just workers' rights today, and uh, and how I mean there was a chocolate factory that exploded last week and six people died. There was. The train wreck in Ohio is like still leaking chemicals, and that probably could have been prevented if we had more railroad workers, uh, you know, on that train. Um, sugar you know, factory, not that far. The away. sugar factory blew up here in 2008. 2008, yeah. Um, I mean, Joseph Wainwright died at the factory uh, three years after the, um, you know, the alcohol explosion. So, you know, just if we don't know our history, we're going to repeat it. It's that simple. So, um, I, I just really want to hammer that home in the film, so, yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask uh, Janie your opinion on this. So in the podcast, um, Nancy, maybe you'll have to detail that for me, but there is that report, right, that the government got that clarified the classification of the explosives, that, and then they could never find this guy, right, the, the government worker who was supposed to tell Cycle, hey, these are extremely explosive devices. So... I know the podcast didn't have a lot of time to go into that detail, but kind of what what is your thinking about what how all that went down? Well, being former military, this happened in Alabama. So you get a memo and you get your orders. You checking out. Memo goes in the drawer, you take your orders and you, you catch a plane and you go. You know? is he left it in the desk drawer. So when all of this transpired and the place, ex, you know, you look at November 16 and you look at February the 3rd. There's like, what, two and a half, almost three months in between. The plant never knew. The plant told Judge Lawrence, the, suit, the plant manager, he received the memo three weeks after the explosion. But my point is, it was authored by the United States government. The United States government was fighting these workers for 17 years. If you knew the truth, two and a half, three months before the explosion, Somebody in the government knew the truth those 17 years. So why play the game? You know, it, it is a sin. It is a sin when you reach in and try to crush the three eternal gifts that's given to all of us freely. Faith, hope, and love. When you reach into that spirit within to crush it, that's a sin. You can't, you can't get around it, you know. You know you're wrong when you try to diminish and crush the spirit of a human being. That's something you should never do. I mean, no human being, not a child, not a woman, not a man. That is wrong, and that is what the government did. If I crush you, if I belittle you, if I publicly shame you, you go and sit down. I, they felt like these manufacturers were less than. But I can say this to you. They, the army cannot march with thy boots. No military can defend any position without supplies. So um, they need to stop playing. Yeah. Right now, you're in a war in Ukraine. You need these manufacturers just like you needed them in Vietnam. Be grateful. Be appreciative. Just say thank you and let's move on. That's all I'm saying. Because you're going to need them again. Well, how about we... Uh, it's been an hour and a half, so uh, yeah. how about we... Uh, We'll let, uh, we'll get let, let everyone come up and have their own questions, yeah, yeah. personal questions if they want. Thank you again, everybody.